So welcome everybody to the iPanel webinar on February 23rd, 2016. Um, our presenter today is Kath Murray and she's going to be talking about integrating an educational approach in palliative care. And I'm going to ask Kath to just give a little introduction of herself before going into her presentation. So let's get started. Okay. Thanks, Kath. Well, thank you very much. So my topic today is on integrating an educational approach in palliative care. And I played with that, with the idea that iPanel is all about integrating a palliative approach in nursing and across all care settings, et cetera, et cetera. So I played with that and came up with the title, Integrating an Education Approach in Palliative Care. And considering in particular the challenges that I often hear from nurses as they prepare and as they teach. And what I'd like to do is talk first about a few things that we need to know about education, about education, about learners and learning, and about nurse educators. And then um, I've been asked to also introduce our materials that we've developed with Life and Death Matters and talk specifically um, with about those materials. And then what I'd like to do is look at examples of how some of those resources are being used in um, core curriculum in long-term care, home and community care, hospices, some regional programs, and just give a sampling of different ideas that help to hopefully bring home um, some of the things that we've talked about at the beginning of the webinar, but also that will help inspire you as you look at how are you going to do education in your um, community. And I see that of the people that had signed up to originally take the workshop or the um, webinar, we've got about five people who had expressed interest from First Nation communities, one from the BC Centre for Palliative Care, uh, someone who is a healthcare assistant, so I'm hoping that that's some kind of a champion who's uh, working in long-term care. Um, Julie, I can't remember what you said your role is, but we've got Anita, Tara and Carolyn who are CNSs and a few students and somebody from Australia. So I hope that this will have application across the way. I will be speaking from my perspective. I decided at first I had planned on doing some research and finding out what's the latest and the greatest and what's being said about education and learning. And then I felt like, no, I needed to speak from the things that I'm hearing and the things I've seen. So, um, um, I would like to also declare my conflict of interest. I'll be discussing materials that I've written and that we have developed through our company, Life and Death Matters. And we have not received any grants, any finances from drug companies, but we are completely open to drug money, so to speak. Um, and then um, I'd like to also have fun with playing with what would an educational approach be in palliative care. Just like I always say that a palliative approach is the integration of principles, the integration of principles and practices of palliative care for people with any life-threatening illness in the disease process and across all care settings. So what does that mean for education if we're talking an educational approach? And I thought a fun one would be an educational approach means the integration of palliative principles and practices in nursing education for all members of the nursing family early in the education of a nursing student through graduation, career, and through and following retirement in any education or work setting. And we could play with that further. But anyway, so we'll be talking a bit about that today. So first of all, let's talk about three things we need to know about education. And to me, this is uh, this has come from the number of times I have heard, my, this is my response to the number of times I've heard nurses talk about challenges, looking at what should they be teaching, when should they be teaching it, how should they be teaching it, um, and the negatives of the fact that we you know, if you do classroom teaching and if you do lecture, then only so many percent is retained. And if you do face to face and if you do mentorship, then there's more and da 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 da. So here's my summary there is no one education program or strategy or resource or educator that will fit everyone. There just is nothing that is going to be perfect for everyone. And similarly, 
There, so there are negatives to absolutely everything we'll do. Any research study that you've seen about education, there's some stuff that goes really well, but we could look closer and we could tear it apart too and say all of the negatives there. Um, and even though there are negatives to everything, there are many positives and there's ways to build in rich learning experiences. And I think I've got this as a slide a little later, but I need to say that my life has been changed by education. I love education. For me, education is, is a, it's a self-care, um, it's a mode of self-care, it is, uh, it, education inspires me, I love it. This is, education isn't something I expect anybody else to pay for for me, I go to it because I love it. And there are things that I learn today that I put in practice today because of things that people have taught me historically. I can remember Della Roberts, one of our nursing, great nursing leaders in BC. I can remember something she taught me back in about 92. I can remember sitting in a class with Gina Gaspard and something that Gina taught me. I can remember sitting and listening to Kamara Van Brenham speak, who's I think in here today. You know, these are people who have taught me and sometimes people will say, you know, I don't remember what they said, I remember how I felt. And, and I think for a couple of those experiences, some of what I remember, I remember specifics but sometimes I remember a love for palliative care and what that means and what that feels like and how I can do it. So, so as you look at education, do not sit and look. Do not let your colleagues sit and just stew about trying to find the perfect thing. Um, do not get um, analysis paralysis. So again, my, I love education and I love learning. There we go. There is rarely a perfect date or time for teaching. There's rarely a date that will be void of meetings or other conflicts. And if we wait until everything is perfect to provide education, then it just won't happen. And I see sometimes in some communities, I see places where people are so busy trying to find the right date that months and months and months go by before something's offered. And meanwhile, all of those people that are um, providing education haven't, or providing nursing care haven't had the education and those people that they've cared for haven't benefited. So don't get analysis paralysis, get moving. The other thing is that programs aren't the only thing to consider, that relationships matter. And I love the old statement that I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. And sometimes this is challenging when you're doing in-house education. And it's one of the reasons that it's sometimes good to share educators throughout facilities. So on the one hand, you want to build on those relationships. And on the other hand, there's times when it's nice to have educators come from the outside who can address things or say things in a different way. So um, continue to build relationships with individuals, but also share yourself around and be able to switch with one another, I recommend, so that you also get some fresh faces in. Uh, why are we going backwards? Okay. Then the next question I often have from people is, how much do I need to teach and how much time do I need to teach it? And they often ask this in regards to our materials that I'm going to introduce in a minute. And so I love that question. So how much time do I need and how much, how, what format should I use? And here's my response. Well, it depends. It depends. Who are your students? What are their needs? What are the issues in the practice setting? What are you hearing? What do you think is important? Uh, what do you have time to teach? Can you afford to backfill staff if, if backfill if staff are in workshops? Can you um, even get staff to backfill if you've got people off on education? What are the issues based on geography? Um, with Gina Gaspard here, she's now working in an area that surrounds the entire province. She's got people in these tiny little communities. And so some of what she might come up with will be completely different than what Carolyn Wilkinson will come up with at Victoria Hospice. So this, this question of, of how much time, um, yeah, there's some great ways to do things and there's some great outlines and we've got lots of great outlines of different ways that you can teach a workshop over a two day or two and a half day or 24 one hour sessions or six four hour sessions or for one hour sessions, but really what 
what can you do, what is possible, and what are the needs. And sometimes that comes down to also what are the needs in terms of um, the health authority will only provide, you know, free people up for one hour or one hour once a month. Um, the other thing that's happening more and more is that the, say for example, the Long-Term Care Act in Ontario has identified that the long-term care facilities have to provide, I think it's 12 hours of education a year. So, okay, so if we've got 12 hours that we need to provide, let's work with that. How can we do that? So I, um, I love the, the statement that a palliative approach needs to be adapted, adopted and embedded in wherever, wherever we're looking in whatever care setting and so does education, need to be adapted, adopted and embedded. So I've put a handout, I've given a handout to Kara, which will be on the website and she'll show you that at the end. And the purpose of it, this particular one, is looking at theories of multiple intelligences. And um, just want to comment on that a little bit. Um, the handout itself is one that I did a bunch of years ago for Fraser Health when I did an education piece there for them, but I really like the handouts and I really, I continue to use them today. So for example, if we think about people having multiple different ways of learning, and we'll, let's talk about that for a minute, um, and people learning best when content is presented in a way that meets their learning style. So let's talk for a minute about just different ways that people um, learn. So if you think about um, those who just love music, and Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, take a music bath once or twice a week for a few sessions and you will find it is to the soul what the water bath is to the body. Love it. Love it. And so if we're talking music, I think about the Fraser Health Symptom Assessment Acronym, which our dear colleague Sharon Steck, um, when I was teaching up in the Yukon one time, uh, they wrote up a song to the tune of Brown Eyed Girl about the Fraser Health Symptom Assessment Acronym. You know, sometimes building in those fun things, we're going to get a lot further at remembering them than if we just do the standard lecture. Music content, connecting with concepts. I love the um, song from Les Mis, Empty Chairs at Empty Tables. There's a grief that can't be spoken. There's a pain goes on and on. Empty chairs at empty tables. Now my friends are dead and gone. And the the singer talks about feeling, you know, his grief, but also his grief at being there when his friends are gone. So um, again, thinking about if we can't get staff away for very many minutes for education, what can we do to bring education in a completely different way? Hmm. What about a song? And then, of course, I love to laugh and I love to have fun. And one of my favorite songs is written by a guy named Peter Elsop. And it's um, My Brother Threw Up on My Stuffed Toy Bunny. And it goes on and something, and it's not really very funny. But then he goes on and he says, but it could have been worse. It could have been me. And again, you know, if you're teaching and it's after lunch, then it's a great time to wake people up to bring something fun in, which just reminds me it's just after your lunch time. So maybe some of you will be wishing we were doing songs. Um, so nature, there are people that learn best through nature and I love this picture here. I wrote a piece a few years ago called Everything I Need to Know About Being with the Dying I Learned from My Dog and you know there are people that just don't learn so well with textbooks but you put them and you think about animals and you think about what animals bring into our lives and, and then maybe somebody will go, yeah, I can understand that, I know how to be I know how to be with the dying. Um, now I think about the one dog that we had for a short time in our life and I, that's not necessarily how I would have wanted to have been with the dying. But we know people and dogs like this little one here that just are the model and the epitome of being with. There's people who do really well with math and logic and critical thinking and crossword puzzles and things. And we've got some um, crossword puzzles in our workbooks. And there are people that just love doing that. And so if that's going to help stimulate the thinking, go for it. And one of the things that I've loved doing has been our comfort basket. And we've talked about this for the last 20, 25 years as a comfort basket. 
And, and so then when I think about comfort baskets, what do we do? What do we bring as individuals to caring for someone who's dying that can bring comfort? And sometimes, yes, that's things that we have on the unit, maybe some cream or some music or um, a book or some poetry. But if we're in a home setting, what is it that's on their shelf? What is it that's on their bedside table? What is it that they like to read? And and what is it that I as an individual bring? So you wouldn't want me to bring my singing voice, but some of you might be able to sing, and that would be something beautiful you'd bring. Similarly, I think though, if you're is if you're as Gina is now working with nurses throughout the communities, the thing that you might talk with the nurses about is what do they need as a comfort basket for them to be able to go and provide education. And we'll come to a picture in a minute that talks that looks about the picture of anxiety. And so some people with with um, who are teaching actually can feel quite anxious. So again, the comfort basket can be quite a nice um, learning aid and tool to explore different ways of teaching um, and of bringing comfort, um, but it's a kinesthetic uh, action thing. One of my favorite things in labs, and, and I can create a lab anywhere, is a table with a foamy and a bunch of pillows, or a floor with a foamy and a bunch of pillows, and being able to teach and show positioning. You know, we, I used to work years ago with a practical nurse, Uta Rack, and she was legendary at being able to get people settled and comfortable. And one night I said to her, oh, Uta, would you help settle me for the night? And there was an empty bed. And she took me in and, and settled me and tucked me in with these pillows and showed me how to position somebody. And I tell you, my life changed. Um, again, it was one of those new skills I had. and. Just loved loved that um, loved that new skill. So again, the opportunity to not only hear about things, but to practice to to position someone and to be positioned by them. And I believe I love laughter and I love humor. Um, I think that humor helps build relationships, help people feel like real people, provides moments of respite. You know, you go down into difficult things when we're talking about loss and grief and all the suffering and the sorrow. And you know, you got to come up for some fresh air every now and then. Um, can preserve, preserve dignity in undignified situations and conveys esteem. I've also heard it and sh saw an article just recently about teaching people from other countries and how laughter and how smiling works cross-culturally and being able to then just use a bit of that to help people get comfortable to then be able to work across the, the language barriers. Um, so long and short of this, is I think one thing that's very important is that we shake it up and we consider multiple learning styles and strategies. And when you look at the handouts that I've put in there, you'll see um, one on experiential learning, one on multiple intelligence, and one on constructivism. And and I that whole theory of constructivism is that we learn um, that we learn best based also on what we know. So if we can build like building blocks then we can um, we can build better when we're building with building blocks, building on things we know versus just pulling things out of the blue. And um, similarly, Brenda Pangeli used to talk about Velcro and that if we can stick it to, if people can stick things that they're learning to something they know, then it's easier for them to then remember. So learn best when they connect to the content they and build on what they already know. And this is one of my favorite quotes on education, and it's from one of my favorite books. And I haven't given this to you in a bibliography, but I recommend that everybody who teaches gets to use to read this. Um, so it's called, um, the book is called The Courage to Teach, and it's written by someone named Parker Palmer. And he says, Good teachers possess a capacity for connectedness. They are able to weave a complex of connections among themselves, their subjects, and their students so that students can learn to weave a world for themselves. Their methods used by these weavers vary widely. 
lectures, Socratic dialogues, laboratory experiments, collaborative problem solving, creative chaos. The connections made by good teachers are not held in their methods but in their hearts meaning heart in its ancient sense as the place where intellect and emotion and spirit will converge in the human self. I love that. And this is my image, I hope, that I'm going to be able to show you to go with this. Oh, no, I'm going to come back to that after, and we'll talk about connecting. This book on the courage to teach, though, is probably... It's probably one of my all-time life favorite books. And he says, you know, you can have somebody who, oh, he said he asked students, you know, what makes a good teacher? And somebody said, well, uh, that's harder to explain, but I know what a bad teacher is. And then as he talked about some of the good teachers, and some, you know, appeared to be giving these boring lectures, and others would do something not wildly creative. But he said what, what all of them did was help students connect with the content. So when you're thinking about teaching someone, some of these people that we have come, they just are so excited about being there. They're just, they're there and they're just soaking up every little bit. And then other people are there because they've been asked to be there, they've been told to be there, or that's part of the criteria for orientation or whatever. So. In those situations, in helping people connect because they see a need, and often that comes through stories, personal stories, a case story, but not a boring case story, one where you, you help them see the problem and see the need. Um, nurse educators. Let's talk about these nurse educators for a minute. So we've talked a little bit now about, learn, about education and programs. We've talked about learners and learning. And let's talk about nurse educators. All nurses educate. Some have education in their job title or their description. But most have diverse responsibilities and very full calendars, and all have different levels of expertise in hospice palliative care, in teaching, in learning, in education, in programs. So I think about Leo, who's here right now, or was here in our um, webinar today, and he's just had the experience of working with somebody who has been an education developer. And what a wonderful experience because that whole piece about developing education was new to him. Um, Carolyn Wilkinson, I'm not sure, Caroline, if education's in your job description or, or not, but it's such a part of your job. I think of a couple nurses right now on Island Health and they're working together and one of them is an educator and the other one isn't, but education is a big part of her job. So I, I had said to um, one of them about, about nurses being full, about them having full calendars, meetings, meetings, and more meetings, and somehow in the midst of all this, they're supposed to be teaching. And the nurse said, right on, you've hit it. So this isn't a big um, in-depth look at nurse educators and, and learning, so please forgive me there. But just a few key points that I think are important about nurse educators for us to remember as we move forward. So life and death matters. Um, in 2004, I went back and did a master's in thanatology, which is the study of death, dying, and bereavement. And I think Kara had asked me to introduce myself, and I forgot to do that. So I had started as a hospice palliative care nurse and had the blessing of working with hospice for Victoria Hospice in, in British Columbia for, I don't know, um, 25 years or something. And over those years, always worked on call. And since about 90 or 92, was teaching um, workshops for home support workers, what they were called that year in, in um in British Columbia, also known as community health workers or healthcare workers or personal support workers or healthcare assistants or resident care aid or resident care assistants, you know the idea. So in 2004, I went back and did my master's in thanatology. And then the following year, I wanted to, fit, to improve my handouts so that six months after taking a workshop that people could um, remember what we had talked about when they were in the middle of a night shift and their brains were kind of numb. And so I wanted to have something that they could 
take away and that they could then look at in the middle of the night. So we developed what became um, the Essentials in Hospice and Palliative Care. And then in 2009, we did a second edition. And that was going along fine, and it was being used partly in colleges and partly in workplace. And then in 2013, we did some research, and I was fortunate to have Anne Bruce from the, um, who was then acting director of nursing at UVic, um, and Antoinette Oberg, who was retired but phenomenal educator from the education faculty with um, University of Victoria, and together with um, our team with Life and Death Matters, we developed a survey and some research questions, and Antoinette did the interviews, and we talked to um, personal support workers and instructors using our resources, and at the end of that, after looking at that research over a number of months, I pulled the team together and I said, I need to make sure that I've heard what you're telling me. So we met together, and at the end of that meeting, I said, the feeling I have is that we need to rewrite this book. Instead of doing this next one as a third edition, I think we need to do this specifically for personal support workers. And the response was overwhelmingly positive that we should do that. So along came, oh, so here now, I'm sorry, now we're going to go in a little bit of a different direction. I thought I, I'm sorry, I don't have a preview of where I'm going next. So. Um, my goal was then was to take this look off the student space. Have you ever, and if, if we could, if you weren't muted, I'm sure we would hear people say that they've seen this look on the face of somebody thinking, you mean I have to look after a dead body or we're going to be working with people who are dying? That somehow they thought that working in long term care meant, you know, um, eternal restorative rehab type care and not understanding where they were going. So my hope was in, in developing resources that would take this look off their face. And actually, it would also, I hope that we would develop resources that would also take this look off the look of a nurse educator who was getting worried about providing education. So um, Parker Palmer talked about helping people connect with things. And sometimes I think that we can make things look really complicated. One of my dear colleagues, Dr. Deb Braithwaite, a hospice palliative care physician, says, you know, this isn't rocket science. And yet sometimes I think we like to complicate things. We need to be able to empower families. We need families to know that this isn't rocket science. We need our frontline caregivers to know this isn't rocket science. We need them to connect with the information and we need them to understand and connect with the simplicity of of what it is that we do, because really the most important stuff we do has some simplicity with it. And to connect with the flame within them and that spirit within them to really come to love this topic. So the resources then we developed after that research was um, a tech, what is now called integrating a palliative approach. And that was really inspired, that um, title, by the work out of Australia um, that I was familiar with from back in about 2007 when I was doing some work for Broadmead Lodge on dying with dementia. And very much inspired by iPanel research. And I just want to put in a plug here for the iPanel research. And you obviously know it because otherwise you wouldn't be on this webinar. But there's a few people who are new to iPanel. And I think it's one of the most important research projects that's happening in Canada and probably internationally right now in terms of hospice palliative care. So the book is um, Integrating a Palliative Approach, Essential for Personal Support Workers. And then we had been asked to develop um, a workbook to go with that for use in core curriculum. And the idea that work that competencies are attitudes, knowledge, and skill, each of the chapters in the textbook are addressed through um, looking at the attitudes, an opportunity for self-reflection, looking at knowledge, and looking at the knowledge in the textbook and helping to apply that, and group small group things and discussions to help develop skill. So here's some examples of a couple of the pages in the um, workbook. Then we were asked, um, the National Hospice Palliative Care Organization in the state said, we don't have anything like that in the states for nursing assistance. So we translated it into American. And actually, right now, I'm down here in Texas, talking to y'all from down here in Texas. And um, 
in the States, the term is usually nursing assistance. But unlike in Canada, where we have um, programs that are sometimes between 500 and 700 hours for a nursing assistant, down here you can graduate as a nursing assistant with, with um, 20 to 50 hours of a course. So the new text now that I'm working on is one for practical nurses, but it's also a practical resource for registered nurses. So it will be called Essentials in Hospice and Palliative Care, a practical resource for nurses. And I'm not sure what the cover is going to look like, but that's the mock-up for today. The other thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to look at how do we help people teach this in core curriculum when they don't have any hospice palliative education? So we put together a podcast library, and I think there's about 45 different podcasts. So if you go to our website for lifeanddeathmatters.ca, go to education, and you'll see um, there the podcast library. You'll see something about videos and about PowerPoints and an instructor's guide. Now, the neat thing about the PowerPoints is that they are their PowerPoints and they have lecture notes with them. So if I'm one of Gina's folks, say I am June or Christine or Sarah or Talia from little communities throughout BC, the neat thing here is that I can come and I can download these and then I can go in and I can say, ah, this group doesn't need this or this or this or this. I'm going to nix this, nix that, nix that. But yes, we need that. And oh, we need to put in some pictures of what's happening locally. So you can just cut and paste and put in some photographs of your community, the phone numbers you call in your community. Just, you know, bring it to life for your community. The other thing is that you might find, like say, say let's just talk about Sarah right now. So Sarah's from a little First Nation community maybe. And maybe Sarah doesn't have a lot of experience in palliative care. No problem. Go to some of the, the podcast library, listen to some of those, and you can maybe listen to them with the people in your community. Or um, there's also a few videos. Now, one thing, Gina, to just know is that we've had people from um, um, none of it who haven't been able to access the internet from some of their little communities. So we've been able to get them some of the resources on in um, hard, whatever you call it, on a CD. So if you need that, let us know. Um, so that's it for that. Um, there's also a blog, and if you go on our website, again, lifeanddeathmatters.ca, you can sign up for the newsletter. Um, but I think that gives a good good introduction to those resources. Just a couple other resources I want to mention. Pallium Canada, their long-term LEAP program, um, they have developed um, a new long-term care LEAP program. And for those who, who don't know about Pallium, go to pallium.ca and you'll find out more and I'd be happy to answer more questions. What they're doing is they're inviting a few PSWs to attend each group. So this would be, now if we've got, um, uh, I think we've got a resident care aide, maybe Anita, not Anita Waltz, but another Anita who's attending. And maybe that Anita would be an example of a PSW healthcare assistant champion who would come to the LEAP program already having had, say, a course like this, and then we'll be able to then take back that information. So there will be some breakout groups that the healthcare workers would go to during the two-day leap, learn about leadership, learn about teaching, and then there'll be a couple hours specifically with our content that's been, uh, with the Life and Death Matters content that's been integrated, and then go home to your area and be able to help educate. Now, um, the, if you're looking at the long-term care leap, one of the important things too to know is that the, when you, when you finish that, you're still going to need to go home and provide education for your healthcare workers, your PSWs, healthcare assistant level people. So, um, the Pallium leap mostly for focuses on your RNs, LPNs, and physicians. Um, if you're not familiar with it, palliativealliance.ca has got some excellent work. Um, and one of the things, um, their, the research project out of Lakehead University was called Quality Palliative Care and Long-Term Care. 
two things that they identified that were especially helpful. One is they identified the role of PSW champions, how important they are and how much you can, how much value you can get from having PSW champions. So then they also developed a toolkit, which is great. All of those are on their website. And also PSW um, competencies, they developed some um, there that are good. So the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association also has a training manual for home support workers. I think the new one is six modules and can be taught in a couple hours. So I want to now spend the rest of our time talking about excellence in education. And I want to just skim through this so that we have time for questions. And I, I want to talk about examples of places to start. And you can get this PowerPoint later so you don't have to worry about writing it down. But the personal support worker competencies out of Ontario are the best in the country, as well as the more advanced competencies developed by PSWs for PSWs, personal support workers. Um, and that's available on Palliative Alliance. Uh, in Canada, the best competencies for practical nurses are the College of LPNs of Alberta, CLPNA, and specifically their competency profile for 2015. Don't go back to their old one. RNs, of course, have the CASN competencies. The CHPC Nurses Group has the advanced standards and competencies. And one of my favorite um, competencies is, are the European Interprofessional Competencies, Part 1 and Part 2. Um, there's a group of nurses in our province who um, their manager, for some reason, didn't want them highlighted by name and maybe because they thought they'd get flooded with requests, but they've done something very exciting and they call it a rapid task analysis. And I realized I was going to send the attachments on that and I forgot to send that to you, Karen, my apologies. But they identified the things that they feel are the most important, that are the most critical for staff to be taught. And then out of those identified what can be done in preparation, in self-study, in online courses, and what needs to be done face-to-face -face and what can be done as follow-up. And another interesting thing, um, Jennifer Kennedy up in Prince Rupert at Acropolis Manor, she did a readiness survey. And so if you can look close enough, you'll see here. Uh, so for example, um, follow up on dietary changes got one star. And people put stars up for things that were more important. Falls prevention got a few more. But palliative approach education got more. And I'll show you in a minute what they've decided to do with that. Another thing that I think is really exciting, and Kathleen, this I think has to do with you in terms of, and, and Gina and others in terms of at a, looking at this at a level of from the health authority, is to set the expectations. So the Champlain region, which includes Ottawa, they identified the learning outcomes that they want covered in a 30-hour course that would be required for all for personal support workers who would be working with, quote, palliative care, unquote, clients. So people identified as palliative care. And um, they wanted in that, they wanted six hours of lab learning. And then they looked at programs. So they identified what the learning outcomes were. And then they have approved, say, um, three programs, our Life and Death Matters program, um, St. Lawrence College, and Algonquin College. And an example of that is one of the agencies in Ontario now who's teaching that at the Bayshore Agency with teaching that throughout Ontario, but also took that to Alberta and had some really interesting comments from those frontline staff. Examples of education programs now in different settings. I hope you guys, I hope I'm not going too fast here. Um, so um, I want to just sh start. I was going to put this at the end, but I thought, well, no, core curriculum comes before practice. So I'm just going to dash through a couple examples of core curriculum. Scott Shaw's done something interesting. They took the, um, they, part, as part of their core curriculum for healthcare assistants and practical nurse students, they integrated our materials. And specifically, they, for the healthcare assistants, they developed a 24 five hour module, one week, five days a week, and they included our materials. They also added in some interesting um, activities like a funeral tour of the funeral home, um, writing your own obituary, a few things like that. And then I was asked to help them with their core curriculum when the new program came out, new at that time, a couple years ago for practical nurses. And BC had put in um, 
learning outcomes for all the levels, all the different semesters, in all the different courses that hadn't identified what learning had to happen. So we wrote learning outcomes for all of those components and dovetailed content that matched with the theme of the semester. So say public health and um, another semester it was residential care, another one it was the community, and another one it was acute care, and with the focus of the course, and basically then wove all our material all the way through. I want to tell you one of the comments that came of one of the students that from the healthcare assistant program a few weeks ago. She said, this was the course that I least wanted to do, but she said, then I took the course and then I was able to care for my mom. I was able to talk to the doctors and the nurses. I was able to be comfortable with her and just enjoyed her the last few days. Niagara College, we did a presentation basically talking about the stuff that is in our video on changes in the way we're dying. We did a presentation for them and about our materials, and the dean, Terry Mines, said this is going to change the focus of our nursing program. And I say that today here because I think it's exciting to see that whole concept of a palliative approach changing the face of nursing programs. Community adult education, there's a new program that's just starting to take on our materials, and they're adding a two-week addition to core curriculum, but they're also doing it with continuing education, and they're looking at linking with healthy aging. Wonderful. So long-term care, Jennifer Kennedy did the readiness survey, then she did a launch, then she got workbooks for her staff, and then what she's doing is each week people will have some assignments to do in the workbook. They'll have access to a textbook to read and study, and each week they'll do huddles or pod talks, they're calling them. So they'll either be able to choose from 20 minutes in all three units once a week, they can go to any one of those, or one hour in a central area twice a week. And then they'll have finish with um, next steps and a one-day workshop. And their purpose in doing this was to achieve more upstream orientation, to operationalize a palliative approach, improve symptom control, da 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 da, -da a decrease um, inappropriate admissions to emergency department. So wonderful example, and again, I can link you with her. Broadmead Lodge did a two-day workshop, and they offered it to all their staff, receptionists, plant services, everybody, and it was called The Dementia Difference, Integrating a Palliative Approach in Caring for People with Dementia. And again, you connect, can connect with Fiona Sudbury, who was there at Broadmead when, that, when she brought that in, or Jim Aldnold, who's there now. But one of the changes that they talk about was that people started using the term actively dying versus he's palliative, or imminently dying versus he's palliative, and started to ask the question in, in rounds, and when they were discussing people, or when people were struggling, started to ask, could he be dying? Could she be dying? So a couple articles about, about that that you can find in the Journal of Palliative Care. Home and community care, um, one group, the group that did the rapid task analysis, they've then gone on to organize lesson plans that are six sessions, one and a half hours long, with pre-learning required, and standardizing that throughout the health authority and looking at evaluating that. Another group in the same health authority has done a pilot project with one and a half hours a month times seven months, no pre-learning required, and again, looking at that and seeing how that would work in that particular community. One home care nurse that I uh, did something with in a uh, train the trainer workshop, one group of home care nurses said, oh, this is great, Kath, because what we can do is when somebody is starting to decline, we can take the books out to, say, the home support worker, the health care worker, health care assistant, who's out in the home and say, look, you know, she's starting to decline, why don't you read chapter seven about last days and hours, and then think about specifically ways that you can support the family and read the pieces about supporting the family because the family's really struggling with this or that. So then by being able to use the materials just in time, and I think, Gina, this would be great, again, when you're working in your little communities, pulling out the stuff that's needed today, right now, what do we need to know right now, may just help facilitate learning. Hospice orientation for um, nurses in Fraser Health a few years ago, and I don't know if they're still doing this, but our old copy of Essentials, not the new one, but the old one, they would give a copy of that to new nurses starting. And one of the nurses just mentioned to Della a while ago how helpful that was, just having a real basic 
piece that they could read through and refer to um, about hospice palliative care, about medications, a little bit about titrating, about the different symptoms. Um, hospice and Fraser Health also put together a self-study guide, which I think you can access. Um, I think it, it needed some more editing, but from that, um, that self-study guide, people could um, be assigned to read things, find things, you know, find the fire hydrant, find this, find that, read that, do this activity. So it was really a self-study guide throughout their orientation. Agape Hospice, and we've got Leo here on the phone, has done some really good work, and I've got a couple of the handouts from them are on the website. Kara will access, show you how to access. But they've done a very structured orientation for their healthcare assistants. The first days, the first four days are really about safe practice, using lifts, doing things like that. So what are the things that if they don't know how to do could really result in harm? Then the first 200 hours, they have um, certain things that they expect to be taught. And then at 200 hours to 500 hours, it's more mentoring by um, somebody on the unit. And um, looking at that by 480 hours, so they can say, Are, is this person um, meeting the needs of a Agape Hospice? And do they understand what hospice is about? So really quite an exciting program that Leo's hoping to have finished by September of 2016. And Leo's sitting there shaking his head and going, yeah, we are hoping. Now here's an example of, um, and the work that they've done is phenomenal. Um, and they've, here's an example of one of the pieces. So for example, here's the competency, understanding the basic aspects to the sub-competencies, the learning outcomes, the delivery time, the pre-training, and the resources. So um, in summary, my hope for you today is that you'll remember that there's no one perfect format. There's, so use diverse teaching strategies and formats and uh, develop relationships because they also matter. Be inspired by the examples I've shared, which is not all inclusive, but um, not to necessarily do what they've done, but to move forward and do what might work best in your community. And I'd like to finish with this final quote on vocation by um, in Parker Palmer's book, and he says, vocation is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And is there anything better than being able to teach about palliative care? I mean, imagine if we had to be teaching people how to use, I don't know, the till at the grocery store. So I um, finish and I thank you and I'm open to questions.